This is an introduction to internationalization, part of the overview of Unicode projects and internationalization event. Hi, I'm Addison Phillips. For many years, I've given a longer version of this presentation as a tutorial at Unicode conferences. I've been involved in uh, internationalization for many years, and on this slide you can see uh, some of the ways that I'm involved in, uh, in the internationalization community. The Unicode Consortium is the premier standards organization for internationalization. You probably best know us for our work on character encodings, especially emoji, but we also provide important standards for other aspects of internationalization. So what is internationalization? Um, I like the definitions we have in the W3C's internationalization glossary. And the one for internationalization says um, that internationalization is the design and development of a product that is enabled for target audiences that vary in culture, region, or language. It's a software development discipline that touches every aspect of the development lifecycle from design and to coding to test and release. The word internationalization is long, 20 letters and eight syllables long. So you'll sometimes see the word replaced with IETN. Um, the 18 stands for the number of letters omitted from the original word. And this odd practice is occasionally used for other terms you'll see in this presentation, such as localization, uh, or elsewhere in the industry for terms like accessibility as A11Y or personalization as P13N. What do I mean by cultural variation? This is a light switch I found in an office I visited in Tokyo, Japan. Are the lights currently on or off in this office? Well, a sticky note pasted to it for probably for visiting Americans, shows how one culture's assumptions about color usage sometimes misleads users with different cultural expectations. Uh, if we look at number formats in software, for example, we see a wider var range of variations there as well. For example, um, the separators can be different. Sometimes the digit shapes vary. Um, sometimes the way that digits are grouped together in large numbers is different. Dates and times are also presented differently. Uh, notice the variation in the separators and the day, month, or year can come first. Plus some locales prefer 24 hour time and others don't. There's also the language difference such as you see in the month names. Uh, and a few locales uh, have formatting details you might not expect like the period after the year in this particular example or perhaps they're using a different year number scheme. So suppose you're the leader of a software team. You're thinking of building a new social game. Um, for an example here, we'll make up one uh, super tic-tac-toe uh, where users can compete with each other, perhaps for prizes and status on social media. And you have visions of headlines like tic-tac-toe craze sweeps nation. But regardless of which nation your craze is sweeping, eventually you'll notice that you're missing potential customers unless you expand internationally. And whatever language you create your software to serve will only address a small fraction of the world population. Here are four of the most widely spoken languages in the world as a percentage of world population. Um, these numbers include people who speak the language only as a second language. So while more than 16% of the world population might speak some English, only about 4% of the world population actually prefers English. And even if your home market is uh, has a large economy or is culturally homogenous population, you can still find the need for language or cultural adaptation within a given country. For example, on the previous slide, we saw that Hindi is spoken by about 8% of the world population. Um, Hindi is one of a number of national languages of India, but not even half of the population of India speaks Hindi, even as a second language. I, your home market might not be as diverse as India, but you might still have customers with different language or regional needs. For example, over a fifth of the US population speaks a different language at home than English. And addressing global markets can also mean having different requirements enter into your software. Often these requirements are more sophisticated than in your home market. Uh, your software needs to deal with things like laws and taxes and jurisdictional considerations, uh, sometimes even within a country. And one way to address these needs would be to spend engineering cycles to fork the code and then modify the software for each new language or each new region or country that you wanted to address. Um, but as you add geographies and languages, you'll find that this doesn't scale. Not only do you have more sets of code to maintain, but 
programming local requirements into the versions you forked off creates additional testing, release, and support burdens for you. Plus, eventually your core development team will come up with a new release of their own, filled with all the features your customers and product managers have been clamoring for, and you'll have to port all those changes or refork the code. And now those local and regional changes you made turn into merge conflicts or major incompatibilities between the versions. Maybe you've modified the data structure or the storage uh, to account for local needs. Locally relevant features you've created in one of those forks might get lost as a result every time you release an update. Internationalized software takes a different approach. By using best practices and APIs built into modern operating environments and programming languages, you can build a single source code base that is global in nature. You can still create specific releases for specific countries or collections of languages, but you'll do it from one, one set of source code, greatly simplifying your development, testing, deployment, and support. This approach divides up the work needed to support languages and regions as well. Software developers do internationalization. Translators and others do the work to create the local product in a process referred to as localization, which we'll look at in a bit. First, let's take a closer look at internationalization. Internationalization can be broken up into some different concepts. We'll start with character and encoding support. This is the area that most people think of as Unicode. Uh, if you're building a new product, for example, you might not have to do anything special because modern operating systems and runtime environments encode and process text using the Unicode character set by default. Users can input a value such as a name in nearly any language. As long as, the, as long as you use a Unicode and character encoding such as UTF-8, you can easily store, process, and display that data. That way you can support many of the languages of the world, such as the list of opponents shown here. You might notice that this list is sorted. That's not something UTF-8 did. The developer had to sort the list of opponent names. Sorting a list is one example of enabling the use of internationalization APIs to make code sensitive to language or culture. Let's look at a demo. So here's that list of opponent names. Uh, one of the names in the list is this uh, Swedish lady's name, Osa. She's got a little cat emoji after her name here. Uh, Osa begins with the letter A with a ring above. And uh, maybe if you're English, uh, you speak English, uh, um, this name is sorted where you expect in the list. If I switch the sorting to Swedish, however, notice that OSA is now sorted after the letter Z in the Latin script alphabet, but before some of these other languages. That's because the Swedes treat the letter A with a ring above as a separate letter in their alphabet, and they prefer it to be sorted after, after Z. If we switch to Serbian in the Cyrillic script, now we see that Vasco is the first entry in the list rather than Amelie. Um, that's because people who, have, who write with a different writing system, such as the Cyrillic, uh, Cyrillic script, uh, expect to see their alphabet first. And of course, other languages have their own uh, requirements and variations like this as well. This list was sorted using internationalization API to enable the code. In this case, we're using the Intel Collator uh, API in JavaScript. This API is passed a locale to identify the language and cultural expectations of the user. So a locale is an identifier that you pass to APIs or set up in the operating environment to obtain culturally effective behavior within a system or process. And the most commonly used locale identifiers are made of a language code followed by a region code separated by hyphens. Uh, the structure of language tags can be more complex. These include different types of region or script codes, uh, different length language sub tags, or fine-grained tailorings of locale settings, such as in the last two examples shown. So suppose you want to display the date of the user's last game. The data value is stored in a locale neutral format, in this case, a timestamp. And you can then use an IETNN API that accepts the locale of the customer. Uh, the locale is used to look up uh, by the API to look up appropriate locale data, which is built into the system. And then it formulates and displays uh, the appropriate string to the user. The application code and the software developer don't need to know how a given locale will render the value, such as the order or content of the fields or which separators might be used. Uh, the internationalization API uses the locale and locale data to do that for you. 
This saves developers a lot of work. You don't need to research all the values or write complicated logic. Internationaliza internationalization simplifies your code and user interface designs. Once the code's enabled, uh, the next step is translating the user interface. The internationalization part, that is what software developers do in translating the product is called externalization. Let's talk about localization first though. Localization or L10M, remember what that means, is the tailoring of a system to the individual cultural expectations of a specific target market or group of customers. Localization includes the translation of user interface, uh, user facing text and messages. Um, but translation by itself may not be sufficient. For example, here, the Hindi localizers have replaced a diverse uh, Western-centric set of photos with a diverse graphic, uh, maybe more appropriate for an audience in India. In terms of coding, uh, this might be an important part of the first program you ever wrote. Uh, programming languages vary. We're using Java here as an example. Unfortunately, this example has an it and bug in it. The string hello world is hard coded into the software. If we wanna make the software display in another language, we'll have to change the code. To fix this, we need to externalize to separate the string from the code. And then at runtime, the user's locale is used to look up which language resource uh, or collection of messages to use. Here we're using uh, ESMX, which is Spanish for Mexico as an example. An API such as Resource Bundle will find the most appropriate set of resources for the customer's locale and load them. Um, this can involve locale fallback. So for example, ESMX might not be available, but a more generic ES, that is Spanish set of resources might be. That way the get string call can retrieve the specific string we want for hello world, in this case, hola mundo. It's important to note the separation of concerns here. The software developer writes the code, which includes the source of the resource bundle. The localization team, including translators, create the various language resource files. Internationalization also helps split the development and localization processes apart. This is important because the typical cycle times for software developers and for localization teams are different. Translations often involve many distributed teams around the globe. Plus, there's a dependency between software development and the localization cycle. Um, changes to the software generally precede uh, the start of being able to translate them. You have to check in the changes before the translators have something to work on. Finally, new localizations can often be added to existing products without the need for additional changes to the source code as well. The red values shown here represent data being inserted at runtime. When externalizing strings, it's tempting to want to build the strings from separate shorter strings like this. You could imagine um, replacing the back half of the string with different things. You win X percent of your matches, X percent of something else. But it's important to use complete thought sentences when doing this instead of concatenating multiple messages. To help avoid this, most frameworks and programming languages provide an internationalization API for formatting messages. Let's look at why that's important. Here's the winning percentage string using ICU for J's message format syntax. And here are some potential translations into Turkish and Japanese. If you mentally matched up the phrase you win with the front part of these target locales, you're in for a surprise. These languages, like many others, have a different grammatical structure than English. The first part of each of these translations actually means of your matches. Um, in some languages, the order in which parameters are inserted might be different from the source language. Another way message formatting can help is with the handling of grammatical agreement issues such as plurals or gender, uh, where the rules for English are different from that of other languages. If you wanted to write the you have one X number of matches um, string, you might be tempted to write some logic like you see here. And even if you didn't hard code the strings, um, you're assuming that there are only three states and that they match what Western European languages do. Some languages have very different pluralization rules from English though. For example, here are some possible Polish translations of the English sentences. Notice how the ending of the word matches, changes multiple times, uh, um, you know, depending on what the number being inserted is. This is because Polish has different handling for plurals. And this diagram shows uses colors to show how plural rules differ in several selected locales. Um, it's uh, much more widespread than this, obviously. This is just a sampling. So here's the code for selecting the correct 
plural using message format in, in the bottom box uh, that's on the screen here. And you'll notice that the, the code doesn't have any dependency in it on what the value of num1 is, unlike the, the top original code that we showed you on the previous slide. Software developer can then write uh, a source resource that looks like this, which meets uh, the English language's needs. And the Polish translator can adapt that, adding the strings that they need and using, uh, using keywords from the IE10N API to uh, provide the additional sentences needed for, for Polish. There's much more we could talk about, both in terms of cultural and linguistic variations and in how IE10N APIs can help. For now, let's review some of the key points in this presentation. Uh, for starters, make a commitment to following IE10N best practices. These include using Unicode and Unicode encoding such as UTF-8 to avoid text processing issues, using a locale to get localized behavior from your software, using resources rather than hard coding the user interface, and then using message formatting APIs rather than concatenation strings. With these basic concepts and awareness that you can build code from the beginning that is ready for the world, you're on course to having your next project succeed globally. Thank you for watching. For more information on the internationalization, including how to participate, visit our website at unicode.org.